So we will start, the first one up will be Craig Linval with the Midland Institute for Entrepreneurship and the FNAM CEO. So Craig, you will be unmuted in just about two seconds. Thank you very much. And here we go. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Glad to be here with you. And here we go. I'm here to talk with you about CEO, creating entrepreneurial opportunities. It's a very unusual entrepreneurship program, which uh, is, I often say, like trying to describe Disney World to somebody who's been to a county fair. It's just very unusual the way it works. And so I'll walk you through a little bit about it, and then I'm happy to ask, answer any questions you might have about the millions of things that I'll leave out. One of the important things for you to know is that the class is funded by investors, not by the schools. So it's, it's offered at no cost to the schools, and it's funded by, you name it. I mean, I'm a, an investor in three different classes. Investors come in at $1,000 a year, typically a three-year commitment. The class meets in businesses, not in schools. So each day we meet in a business. This is uh, the boardroom of, a, of Midland States Bank, and the, actually the room we're meeting in right now is very much like that at a different company called Agricell. We have students in our program in Effingham from six different high schools, but it's important for you to know that kids get two high school credits, and it's, it's an accredited class. So they get two high school credits for taking the class, and they meet every day from 7.30 to 9.00. It's interesting, the other day, a professor from the University of Illinois at Springfield was saying that we get more time with our kids in a year than he gets maybe with entrepreneurship minors and some entrepreneurship majors the whole time they're in school. So it's a wonderful way to spend some really intense time. During the course of the year, one of the things the kids do is start their own businesses. And they range, my goodness, from one girl wrote a book about her experience in the class, uh, the girl up on the upper left, you can see that's a photography business. The one on the right is scarves. So she had those made for her. The bottom right was school spirit wear. The bottom left was an electronic recycling business. This year, we've got someone who wants to start a tea business. We've got a girl making, I think they're called pillowcase dresses for little girls, all the way up to a couple of boys who are, they formed a company a couple of years ago in the class called Visto where they convert vehicles to run on natural gas and now on propane, and they're doing their first uh, semi-conversions right now. They just did one over the weekend in Columbia, Missouri, and are working on their first semi-fleet right now. During the course of the year, the kids also write two to three business plans, and this is one of the areas where we make extensive use of broadband. So you can see here the kids, uh, I, I like for them to have the experience the first time of writing a business plan, which is incredibly overwhelming. The second time they do it, they get to present their business plan to uh, bankers and investors one-on-one, -on -one, just like they would in real life. And then they do it a third time so that they really, I feel, have a pretty good sense of how this works in life. During the course of the year, we'll also visit about 50 businesses with our Effingham kids. And it's every conceivable kind, from manufacturing to retail, service, little bitty, great big. Any place that will have us, we go and learn. I think we've already been to close to 40 businesses this year. And our kids will learn from a wide range of speakers. Uh, typically, it's about 125 speakers during the course of the year. I think this year we're already over 100 people who have either conducted tours of their business, come in to share their expertise, or had substantive conversations with the kids in panels and discussions. And that can range from financial matters to legal structures, farming, international marketing, personal philosophies, just and stuff that's in the news. Uh, this morning we had a guy in class who talked about he buys leftover product from factories. So he had a, uh, a laundry detergent and he bought, I don't know, 2,000 pounds of laundry detergent was left over, so he was repackaging it and selling it under a different name. They get to meet all kinds of people, and it establishes this network that they can then utilize after they get out of their class. Each student will also have a mentor from the business community. For some, it will be the start of a lifelong friendship, and for some, it'll be a professional relationship for that year. It just depends on the two people involved. But one of our driving goals in this class is to encourage kids to come back to live and work and raise families and start businesses in Effingham County. And these personal connections are where that happens. It's, I think every community in the country worries about their kids leaving. And I think most every community has uh, forward-thinking people who understand that it's critical that you connect with your young people. 
I think where they get lost is, okay, how do we do that? How do you actually connect? Bringing in a guest speaker once a year doesn't do it. Going on a visit once a year doesn't do it. It's this kind of ongoing engagement that, in my opinion, does it. So the Midland Institute for Entrepreneurship was formed to help other communities start classes like this. It's such a transformational experience for everybody involved, the teacher, the students, the business community. So the institute was established to provide expertise and training for other communities who want to start this kind of thing. So we provide both uh, visits on my behalf to communities who want to start, and then a, a week or two ago, groups from each of the new communities came to Effingham and spent the day training on how to form the board that governs the class, how to work with schools, how to find the right kinds of students, how to find the right kind of teacher, all that kind of thing. I've written a manual both for communities and for teachers to help them understand sort of the mechanics of how to do this and for the teacher how to create the kind of learning environment where kids uh, will describe it as having taken the lid off of their learning where they can go as far and fast as they want to go. And then I do ongoing training and mentoring for teachers. So you can see where our classes will be next fall. Sauk Valley, which is based in Sterling, Illinois, and Sangamon CEO, which is going to be based in Springfield, are both recipients of our help, courtesy of the Broadband Innovation Fund. So they are ready to go. Uh, Effingham County is original class. Illinois Valley CEO is in its second year. And then Crawford County, which is based in Robinson, and Davis County in Indiana will start as well next year. So, you know, next fall we'll have six classes. Uh, I've probably got at least a half a dozen communities who are hot to trot about starting in the fall of 2014, and then places around the country that have expressed an interest in either having me speak about this kind of endeavor or to actually get a class going in their community. So it's an exciting thing. This is my 34th year of teaching, and I have to tell you it's the most exciting, transformational, remarkable, rewarding, satisfying thing I have seen in all of those years. Our students are starving for this kind of learning where they are connected with people around the world. Just to give you a couple of brief examples of how broadband enters into the world that our students occupy, uh, last week while we were in class, one of my students slipped out because she was Skyping a guy in China to talk about sourcing some of the product that she's uh, working on. Uh, the next day we, we Skyped a lady from Florida who came in and talked to the CEO people about how you do the kind of things that we do in CEO. Our, as often in class something will come up and we'll talk about things and uh, the other day it was how much does a pineapple cost? I won't get into the discussion but that was the question. Two seconds later some kid has his hand in the air saying I know how much a pineapple costs. Students now are used to the world that you and I are occupying right this moment where they are researching and looking at things while a discussion is going on, they're posing questions while a lecture is going on. That's just the world that they live in. They're able to do that kind of thing and uh, broadband certainly allows us to do that in our class. So if you don't know about CEO, here are a couple of good websites for you to look at. Effingham CEO is the website for our class in Effingham and the Midland Institute website is uh, a website that kind of gives you an overview about CEO and some of the work that the Institute is doing. So we are very grateful to be involved in this innovation fund. It's making a difference in communities and kids and I love it that uh, starting next fall anybody who wants to will be able to go to Sterling or go to Springfield and sit in on a class and watch how this works. Uh, it's a wonderful thing that is uh, taking place right as we speak. So that's all I have to share with you about the broad broad overview and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Craig, for that presentation. And I know this is one of the programs that our communications team has had the opportunity to interview and video. And the staff comes back so excited and so enthused and says the kids that are involved with this are just phenomenal kids doing great things. So we at Broadband Illinois are very honored and fortunate to be a part of this program. And if there are any questions, you can type them into the question area or raise your hand and I will have Nathan unmute you. Okay, Craig, the first question, what does a community college 
or a community need to bring to the table in order to put a CEO program in motion? Well, thank you for that question. Uh, the budget for a class depends on how experienced and expensive the teacher is. It's a half-time teaching position, and I would say that the teacher is probably 98% of the budget. So you need to know that you can get somewhere between 25 and 50 investors, depending on the cost of your teacher. And typically the way it works is that I go to a community and talk to a group of core leaders. It can be uh, some communities have been like a rotary meeting where they've invited extra people to come in, or sometimes it's been a place where it's a chamber of commerce banquet or something like that to get people kind of excited about it. It takes about a school year to get going, so you have to have a business leader or leaders who are willing to really ramrod this thing. Uh, you have to have school people who see, well, School people generally, when it doesn't cost anything and it's great for kids, they're on board already. But schools who are interested and flexible and working with their kids, you need those two things. And then it takes about a school year to put one together just because of the, the things that have to happen for the kids to be able to sign up for it. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is, can you provide an example of one of the high school students that have had success with their business after graduating high school and college and beyond. Sure. Well, this is the fifth year of our class, so our first group of students is just now in their senior year in college. Uh, and I will share quickly that we've had 88 students graduate in the first four years. 87 have gone on to college. It's not something we necessarily promote one way or the other. It's just that many of the kids have gone on. Uh, I'll be honest, I don't really care if the business that our students start when they're in the class is successful or not. Because you, you rarely meet an entrepreneur or a successful business person that says, you know, I had one idea and I did that idea and everything went great and here I am today. You much more often hear, I had nine businesses I started, six were total disasters, but I took what I learned. If a student learns nothing but I can't make money doing this, that's okay with me. Uh, of the 80 or so businesses that were started, in the first four years. About 15 to 20 of those kids continue to run their businesses through college. About five to 10 have started new businesses. And uh, I would say this, this, this pair of boys who does the fuel conversions are probably going to be the first ones to have a brick and mortar place and employees. But other ones who have video production, uh, one young man has continued to do very well with that. Uh, the girl who wrote the book about her experience in the class has continued to sell books. She's got a second book underway. Her um, work with publishers and agents has led her to do some uh, freelance PR work for them. But uh, regardless of whether that student's business is their ticket to success in and of itself, it completely changes the arc of their life and it changes what they think they're capable of doing. And that's the most important thing for me. If I can create people through this program who are successful, who are thinkers, who can communicate, who can collaborate, who can solve problems. What they choose to do with that is a detail because they'll be great at it, whatever it is they do. And then my hope is some of them will want to come back to Effingham County and do it there. Perfect. Thank you very much. If there are no other questions at this time for Craig, I will turn the microphone over to Bill Buchanan, who was part of, um, he was very patient and understanding in the December when we were having a little bit of the technical difficulty. So I thank Bill for offering and, and joining us on this round of the webinar series. And Bill, in about five seconds, Nathan is going to have you also unmuted and hopefully you'll be able to get your slides up and start. Hi there. Great. Bill, we can hear you perfectly. Okay. I'm just pulling up my slide here. Sorry about that. No problem. Thanks. Okay. Um, my name is Bill Buchanan with McDonough Telephone Cooperative. We are located in West Central Illinois. And, uh, we are a recipient under our uh, subsidiary MTC Communications at, of the Broadband Innovation Grant, and I want to walk everybody through that a little bit, what we're doing. Um, I'm going to uh, start here with um, our, 
our backbone fiber and basically what uh, this I, I put this in here the the grant doesn't cover any infrastructure but I think it's important to understand the concept of what make what McDonough MTC communications does um, both by itself and with its network partners we, we build um, we've been in business for uh, 60 years and we provide telecommunication services to, to farming and ranching areas of West Central Illinois I think um, one of the uh, one of the important things to point out is we've been we've been deploying fiber optic networks for for well over 30 years um, and uh, this is this backbone fiber is basically you can see it stretches from um, it, it's our specific network it stretches from Monmouth down uh, just south of Macomb and and then with our partners we stretch from the Quad Cities down to Quincy and all the way from the river over to uh, almost to Peoria so uh, just a little highlight about that there Hey, Bill. When we look a little closer here, um, what I've zoomed into here. Yep. Oh, Bill, sorry. Go for ahead. some reason, um, we can't see your slides. We can't, okay. and then we had That's a couple of good. people type. Okay, hang on here. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Can you see nope, can you see him now? Yes, now we can. Uh, can everyone please raise your hand if you can see Bill's slides? There we go. Perfect. Thank you. The uh, the first slide that I had up was uh, uh, just showed us uh, our fiber optic backbone network. Um, I'm not sure why I can't get it to go back here. I'm trying to do that, uh, but basically the the it just showed um, kind of what I had explained a, a network from from Monmouth, Illinois, down to south of Macomb, uh, and then. This one here is zooming in a little bit to Macomb, and what I'm looking at specifically here is WIU's um, campus. For those of you that can see that, it's the red line is the the fiber facility that we had to install in order to get fiber out to the farm. And if uh, and when I'm talking about the farm, I'm talking about WIU School of Agriculture. And what we have uh, going on out there is in historically the the students at WIU that are in the School of Agriculture, uh, a number of their classes are done on campus, but a number of the, the labs and things are done out on what, what we call the farm. Multiple buildings um, out there from, from livestock facilities to, to uh, testing labs to a, a sale barn. And so what we've done is um, we've installed fiber optic, and again, this is not part of the grant, but just to lead up to, to what we're doing and why we had to do it. Um, we've installed fiber so they could have broadband capabilities out there. Prior to this happening, just um, a few months ago, uh, basically all they really had out there was a dial-up type of connection for the internet. So everything that the students were doing had to be done on a on a dial-up basis out there, or wait until they got back to the main campus. So we've we've installed this fiber. It is hooked up now, and and uh, we're working on the project that is that is uh, the basis around the grant, which is putting content over that in, in, a, in the terms of broadband and, and the goal of that really is to get content uh, made at Western at the School of Agriculture out to members in our region that are that are customers and, and, and farmers and producers uh, within our region and, and around the state. Um, I am having a hard time getting the slides to, I don't know why they're not going anywhere here. Um, give me one second. I'm trying to forward to the next slide. Okay, not a problem. And uh, Bill, if you need to, you can try and forward your slides to either me or Nathan, and we can also put them on our computer if that works better for you. Okay, I will. Uh, I may have to do that because it's it's not allowing me to run the slideshow at all. Okay. Okay. We'll take a pause while you go while you do that, and then I am going to unmute Craig again because there was one final question that I did not see and I apologize for that and Craig the 
question for you is, hold on one second, I'm going to pull it up again. Craig, the question for you is, have you involved handicap or special education students in this program? Uh, let's see. I would say, I'm going to say, i got to think back on all the kids I've had. I'm not aware of their, of their GPA or of their school situation most of the time. My guess is that there have not been special ed. There is... Uh, a disabled guy who was one of our mentors and regular visitors to the class but students apply to be in the program and so there's no reason that they couldn't uh, the fact that they haven't doesn't mean that they couldn't uh, so this the uh, the application procedure is a written essay and then letters of recommendation from I believe business and professional people and then a very important one from their guidance counselor so those are the things that matter uh, and I would I would guess that I know I have three or four straight A kind of kids every year because they're easy to pick out. The rest of them I have no idea, and I would guess that I have a lot of BC and CD students. I would just guess, uh, so they would absolutely be welcome. I'm just I'm not uh, I'm trying to think here. There have been some pretty poor students, but I don't know that any of them have been identified. Uh, certainly learning disabilities, but I don't think anybody has been identified as special ed. I believe we may have uh, one other question, and you are um, unmuted, Arnell, so uh, go ahead, it's all yours. So, Arnell, are you able to hear us okay? Yes. Hi, uh, did you have your hand raised? We have you unmuted. If you had a question or a comment? No, I, no, I didn't. Oh, okay. Uh, that was my question about the uh, special ed students. Thank oh. you very much for that answer. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Craig. And um, Bill, it looks like I think you were able to get yours working. So we will have you unmuted again. And you can start where you left off. Okay, I will sure try to continue this here. It's let me go back into the slides here and start over. Um, there we go. It looks like hopefully everybody can see those changing now. Um, anyway, into the into the grant proposal, the the part of the of our project that is what the grant is. We're working with the WIU School of Agriculture to develop um, content and applications that will push data out to our regional ag producers. And, and namely, most of what we're doing is, is for our students. If you look at the high school, junior high, and even the elementary kids, but, but really focusing on the 4-H and the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, ag, the ag students. Um, as Craig had said in his, we have a, a situation here where we have a lot of our students are they grow up and they leave the region and our goal with this is really to utilize the broadband for the students uh, to learn about WIU School of Agriculture but also for for them and their farming families and and the farmers in the region to learn uh, some of the the, the uh, educational opportunities that that uh, the WIU School of Agriculture offers to kids in, kids in our region and outside our region Again, the goal is to with the, with the broadband technology is to to retain some of our uh, some of our population base here in in the rural areas. Um, the second piece of ours is to work. We work with uh, AIEC, the Association of Illinois Electric Cooperatives, um, and we're developing a dashboard uh, interface again for for the schools mainly to use junior high, high school, and even elementary students uh, to talk about um, how uh, energy alternative energies would work and and AIC has installed a solar array and we're collecting data from that that and we'll uh, be pushing that out to a web portal to view online in a real-time basis um, as far as to the farm you know the things that go on out of the farm there's there's so much technology around the farm and and what students are learning what they're doing uh, uh, whether it be um, uh, 
from a livestock application to a to a production application of of uh, corn beans whatever they might be farming but we're taking uh, the first step of what we're taking is um, the the bull sale is kind of our first run at this and and uh, this year March 15th 7 p.m. is the 41st annual bull sale basically what happens is producers from around the region not just our region but multi-state producers send bulls in uh, they get finished here at Western Illinois University and based on their, their different um, their different feed rations and and they they track the the rate of gain and really look at genetically how these these uh, uh, different bulls are are uh, progressing they'll go in and they'll um, they record all this data and it'll be available uh, for buyers to to uh, it look at and then and then be able to bid on these bulls at the sale one of the things that's happening today is our our auctioneer uh, Monty Louderman is is doing a a uh, recording uh, interview today that will that will run in front of the bull sale uh, in March, and this recording then explains the process, the auction process. So not only the, the the people that are involved in the bull sale, but the students that are learning about it can, can learn about the auction process. They can learn about um, you know why an auction is the right way to sell livestock and things like this. So he'll he'll be doing this documentary on on auctioneering that will go out over our uh, both the the local channel, which is an IP based um, video channel. As well as a stream right to the to the website, both WIU's and our website. Um, the second piece of that is is WIU has a a, a really uh, high end judging team, and there's six or seven uh, students that make up that judging team, and they've won national awards all around the country. They will also put together a little documentary that talks to the students again, talking mainly to the students about what makes a uh, a bull, uh, a $2,000 bull, and what makes this bull a $7,000 bull or a $10,000 bull, and so they'll really get into the genetics of the bull. They'll get into and, and a lot of that information that they've studied uh, in the time they've had these animals. They will do that. So um, that's the first thing we're starting with. That will air March 15th. Um, but then from that, we're also creating some real distance learning opportunities, and we always think of distance learning in uh, at least in the rural areas as being able to learn from a, a teacher in, a, in another school district or or at a university somewhere else but this application that we're using we have a really uh, uh, high-end uh, hog production or swine production facility in Carthage and we have all of the farms that they that they uh, produce swine in out um, we have fiber to all of those, and then now with fiber to the farm, we can we can give them some real-time connectivity between the farm, the, the production facility, and the and the students classroom. So, and and is anybody that's involved in swine management or or that type of production understands that animal health is the critical issue, and the animals are uh, uh, it's really important to keep their their health good. So, instead of bringing students in to see how these these are managed. We'll be able to take an instructor in, or one of the one of the uh, uh, swine management people can go in and actually take real time video and and show what's going on in those facilities without putting the the animals in any type of uh, danger. So it'll be a distance learning application for animal health as opposed to just a distance limitation, and uh, again utilizing the the broadband network to be able to do that. Um, most of what we'll be doing will be aired on what they call university television here at WIU. It, it's uh, on their own channel, but it's also in, in uh, conjunction with our IPTV system. We have a, a stream that reaches everybody in the region from, from uh, just south of the Quad Cities to just north of Quincy, again from the river almost to Peoria, so the whole west central region of the state. Um, many of the rural areas are covered by this, this one of these television channels. Um, <clears throat> and then the the part that I talked about with AIEC and their uh, uh, the portal on alternative energies is to develop a web portal utilizing their solar array so the kids can see based on certain times of the day um, what you know whether the the on the 
sunny days, over, overcast days, what kind of power is being generated by these solar panels and, and utilized um, for them to learn in, probably in their science classes. One of the things that AIEC does, and again, it's the Association of Illinois Electric Cooperatives, is um, there's 32 electric and telephone cooperatives in the state of Illinois. And we sponsor, one of the events that we do every year is we sponsor over 300 rural high school students um, from, our, from all of our areas stretched from the north to the south of the state. Um, we take them to Springfield to learn about government and how the state government works, as well as learn about cooperatives. From there, a lot of those students then apply to go to what we call our Youth to Washington tour. And our youth tour, we take um, uh, students from all over the country, cooperatives from all over, all over the country, take students from all over the country to, to DC, again, to, to learn about um, the government aspects and the cooperative aspects of, of our businesses. So <clears throat> this is an opportunity for us to educate uh, educate the students about the, the alternative energies and the, and the web portal and how to use it. We'll also look at bringing in some of our, uh, at least in our market, our, our uh, high school and junior high teachers that are involved with, with science and uh, give them a kind of a tutorial on how this portal will work. So this has my contact information, um, cell phone, email, and uh, I appreciate the time. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Thank you very much, Bill. And similar to the CEO project, this is one of the programs that our communications team was able to go and interview and take some video of. The last Broadband Illinois newsletter, there is an article uh, um, interviewing Bill and a small video. So we welcome you to um, look on our website at broadbandillinois.org in the newsletter. And you can see Bill and his presentation there. If there are any questions, please type those or raise your hand and we can unmute you. Okay, the first question, will any school have access to the portal on wind technology or do you have to be a part of the Illinois Wind for Schools program? If so, who do they need to reach out to? This one will will be this will be accessible to really any school, not just in the state, but but anywhere. And really, it's being uh, what we did is we're not using the wind um, technology; we're using the the solar application. But it just mainly for for awareness for students to learn about alternative energies. As far as the wind program, um, <clears throat> that one probably is a little more. Uh, a little more confined to to people that participate in that, but this is this portal is going to be open really to to any educational opportunities that that would take place in in both Illinois and and outside the state. Outside of oh, I'm sorry, the next question outside of the content funded by the Broadband Innovation Grant, what other long term things is WIU Ag program hoping to do with the fiber connection. The main the main ones are as they develop things on the farm, uh, whether it be bringing in, uh, say, a John Deere or a Caterpillar to to uh, you know engineers in to to show them some new technologies. The main thing is to take that content, package it up into a, a product that we can push out to our our uh, producers in the region. Um, and vice versa, we have uh, a lot of our farmers and, and uh, livestock people in the region are, are doing some pretty innovative things and they will have the opportunity to share that um, either in a real time or a, or a pre-packaged basis with the WIU students. So really the next, the next steps to this is to continue to build a, a library of information and uh, it's our goal as MTC Communications and it's kind of our dedication to our, our communities and to trying to sustain um, the agriculture in our area, we are each year going to try to um, try to come up with some some funding to assist the School of Agriculture to do this. Okay. 
Thank you very much, Bill. I don't see any more questions right now for your specific project. I'll take one last look. No. Okay, the next one is going to be Kelly with the Six Mile Regional Library. Kelly, we are going to unmute you. And did you want us to use the slides that you sent us or do you have yours there to use? Okay, my screen is up there. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Can everyone raise your hand, please, if you can hear Kelly? Thank you. It's great, Kelly. You're good to go. Okay, thanks much. Uh, my name is Kelly Meyer with the Six Mile Regional Library District. And um, I started with the program in December to do some technology and do some technology training for the library. And it's been really interesting uh, the last two months, just getting to know the community and what they're needing. Um, Base-based technology skills is what the community is, is needing. What I'd like to talk about today briefly is um, what the project... Whoop. Let's try that again. Why does it keep ending? Hold on. Clicking the wrong one. There we go. So I'm going to talk today about the project goals and some of the milestones that we've achieved, uh, achieved and then some of the challenges that have been coming up um, with the training. Um, the goals with the uh, grant when we applied for it was to extend the benefits and values of broadband by, by taking the training out. Uh, we've been uh, wanting to host classes in local schools, the park districts and townships. I have confirmed um, training with the one of the township locations, and we've got uh, classes scheduled out till July. Um, that's one per month, so that's pretty good. I figure we'll average uh, probably 180 to 200 people will be able to get um, get some digital digital literacy skills for them, which I'm very excited about. The next. Uh, uh, goal is to contact the park districts to see if we can use maybe some of their facilities. Uh, we've also been hosting classes with we have two facilities and um, I have six or I don't know six months out scheduled at the branch facility and I have conducted a couple here at the main facility as well. And I think what's been most exciting since is uh, kind of the, the personal connection with the, the library patrons and the, the community here in Granite City and, and what they're needing. Um, a lot of them are needing job skills. Uh, they're looking for jobs. They don't have the, the good set of literacy skills to get those jobs that, are, that they're looking for. And it's, it's, it's frustrating for them because they do want to be better. They do want to have these skills. So I'm confident that the, the library is going to be a big help with these patrons. Uh, obviously the milestones, as I was saying, that we've accomplished is I was hired. Um, the equipment has been purchased. It all seems to be functioning, which is always a good sign. And the curriculum is an ongoing thing. Um, as I meet more and more community people out there and what they're looking for and what they don't understand with the digital technology, I kind of rechange some of the curriculum as we move along. Um, I've also been offering some one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions with people um, that need a little bit extra help. And it's, it's fun. It's fun. I really enjoy teaching them and helping them move along in their lives. So we've completed some January sessions already. And uh, like I said, we have two, three February sessions scheduled. Yeah, three. And then for March through July, I've also been scheduling. We've got two scheduled per month. So I'm, we're going to be training quite a few people over the next few months. And, and I've not secured all the places I'd like to go to at this point. This is kind of, I just wanted to share this with you as a librarian. Um, the digital literacy skills are so important anymore in the world. This is not showing. That's been up there the whole time. 
um, this is kind of my mantra whenever I do train uh, people. You know, I have to remember that they, they need all these skills to function in a daily life anymore. Um, it wasn't like that a few years back, but now they're definitely needed everywhere. So uh, it's a good quote to keep uh, above your desk and think about every time uh, you're helping a patron. Some of the challenges is uh, coming up with a skills assessment uh, since there's a broad range of patrons. Uh, some have more skills or better skills than others. Uh, some of their experiences are very diverse. Some have never touched a computer and some are pretty comfortable with it. Um, so that's been a challenge, trying to come up with training material and keeping it simple for them, ones that need it, and then uh, keeping the ones that know more a little bit more engaged. So that's, that's the biggest challenge. Long term, I think it would be good to involve more of the high school students, uh, maybe to do some one-on-one -on -one tutoring with the seniors. There's a couple libraries that are doing that program and then uh, creating online tutorials for the patrons that can access the, com the internet through their homes so they can uh, gain even more skills. But it's been a challenge, but a fun challenge, and it's just beginning actually. So um, I can't wait to see how the community, how we've helped the community over the next uh, six months. Any questions? Thank you, Kelly. I am looking right now to see if there are any hands being raised or any questions. And I apologize for my voice. I've had a cold. Oh my gosh. There's, there is something going around. I think we've, in my household, been battling it for about six weeks. So I fully understand. Mm -hmm. uh, the first question, how are students identified for uh, the, the program or community or citizens? Yeah, they're adults, actually. They're all adults. And basically, um, we make announcements. We haven't started the official advertising because we haven't needed to. Every time a flyer is hung up, the class fills up immediately. But they're all adults that are looking for these digital skills. So there are no students at this uh, no, you know, K through 12, or no high school students. They're all adults. Did I answer your question? I believe you did. Uh, second question is, what equipment did you pur purchase to establish that milestone? Uh, what we purchased was, actually, I could probably have Talon explain everything to you better than that. Um, let me let... Talon, explain everything that was purchased. Hi, yeah, uh, I'm Talon Curran. I'm the operations manager here at Six Mile Regional Library District. And um, I made most of those equipment purchases. And a lot of it was um, we purchased 12 Lenovo ThinkPad uh, laptops. Um, we also purchased two Pelican cases for those so we can put six in each, uh, six laptops in each case, and uh, they're foam padded on the inside and you can customize them. Um, and they have wheels too for moving around when we go on these mobile sites. Um, we also got, uh, for any place we go that we can't connect to their internet, we did go ahead and get a uh, 4G access through Verizon. And um, in order to hook up all 12 of those computers at the same time, we can't just get one of their hotspots because most of those basic hotspots uh, only support 10 devices. So what we did was we bought the little USB 4G modem and a router for it that uh, basically allows us to connect up to 32 devices at the same time. As well as, oh, what else did we buy? <laughs> yeah, we, we, did, we bought a projector. Um, we bought a portable desk that's, that actually folds up so we can take it out on site. And and a portable, uh, a, uh, a portable projector stand, um, and we bought yeah we bought mice for each laptop because a lot of especially seniors do not like the idea of a touchpad. <laughs> they don't like to use it. They don't like anything about it. So we make it easier for them and have the mice. Um, 
one really nice thing that they purchased that we purchased was a uh, a flash drive and it's actually a great gift for them because then I can you know demonstrate to them what what storage is because you know that's a concept a lot of people don't understand if they've never uh, used a computer yeah and then right, they, right now everyone who gets in on the class gets a free flash drive so that's kind of fun they enjoy that they enjoy that and some mouse pads kind of a promo thing for them uh, which they enjoy and then um, any of the, the handouts, I'm trying to really give them some nice handouts and tutorials and exercises that they can take home and practice if they do have access at home. Okay, great. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Talon. Anything else? I don't see any other hands being raised and no questions. Again, after all four presentations have been made, we will have question and answer at the end if there are questions that come up during any of the presentation of the four, we will be happy to address those. The final one today is going to be Nick Hayward. And Nick is with the Tri-County Regional Planning Commission. So Nick, we, I believe, have you unmuted. Can you hear us okay? I think I'm still active, aren't okay. I? There we go, Nick. I think oh. now it's unmuted. Can you hear us okay? Yes, I can. Thank you. Perfect. And uh, just to confirm, can I have a show of hands if people can hear Nick? Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Nick, I will turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Anne. And again, I'm Nick Hayward with Tri-County Regional Planning Commission in Peoria. We are the regional planning agency for the greater Peoria area that consists of Peoria, Tazewell, and Woodford counties. And our grant-funded project is the Focus Forward CI Broadband Initiative. So the Focus Forward CI Broadband Initiative is a regional broadband adoption effort for Peoria, Tazewell, Woodford, and Mason counties. So although our agency typically serves just those first three counties, Mason County is also involved in this particular effort. And if you look at the logo at the bottom of the screen, Mason County is located adjacent to our region to the south. And so the whole idea behind our broadband adoption effort is to increase broadband use in order to strengthen economic development in the region. So our project consists of three phases. Right now, a, an assessment of how broadband is used in the region is being conducted. Using the results of that regional broadband assessment, a customized broadband education program will be developed that will provide information as to how broadband can be used more effectively for economic development purposes in the region. Once that education program is developed, a series of awareness sessions will be presented that will communicate, uh, to, communicate to individuals how broadband can be used most effectively for economic development. There will be 10 awareness sessions altogether uh, that will be held in May of this year. And then this broadband initiative is being housed within a larger initiative called Focus Forward CI, a CI being Central Illinois. A Focus Forward CI is a transformative regional economic development planning process currently occurring for our region. And I want to talk, talk more about Focus Forward CI because the genesis of that initiative is what led to this broadband initiative. So Focus Forward CI is an initiative to develop a new economic development strategy for the four county region uh, in the greater Peoria area. I mentioned that this process is transformative. And that's because there has been no planning process in our region 
that has engaged as many people as this initiative is. To date, this initiative has engaged more than 1,000 individuals uh, through a series of meetings we've held, through different action teams that have been created in order to help guide this planning process. The magnitude of this effort is really astounding for this region. So it's been a very exciting thing to witness and to be a part of. And for more information about Focus Forward CI, you can go to that website that you see on the screen to hear all about this new economic development planning process that's occurring here in the Peoria area. This is an image from a large public meeting that was held in July that kicked off Focus Forward CI. There were 250 individuals at this meeting that represented elected officials, business leaders, leaders of not-for-profit and social service agencies. But really, really the entire region has become engaged in this effort. The gentleman you see on the screen is Jim Baumgartner, who is an executive with Caterpillar and he is the chairman of the Regional Steering Committee that is overseeing Focus Forward CI. So it's great to have Caterpillar support of this initiative. And really, there's widespread support from both the private and public sectors. So again, this Focus Forward CI initiative is unlike anything that we have seen here in the Peoria area. So some background on Focus Forward CI and on how this broadband initiative came to be. So in the fall of 2011, elected officials in our region first expressed interest in exploring alternative, alternative approaches to how economic development can occur regionally. A series of interviews was conducted and over 300 individuals in the region were interviewed all together. And at the beginning of 2012, the major finding from the series of interviews was that our region lacked collaboration. We weren't collaborating to the extent that we could be to have a more robust economic development effort. So based on that finding, a series of 11 recommendations was developed as to how economic development could be strengthened in the region. And those 11 recommendations were approved by each of the four counties and were also approved by the Illinois River Valley Council of Governments here in the Peoria area. So the major governmental entities in the region approved these recommendations and approved the need to examine a new approach for regional economic development. In late July, uh, that kickoff meeting you just saw the image about was held, and that was the official beginning of Focus Forward CI. So currently, Focus Forward CI is in a one-year process to develop that new economic development strategy for our region. That strategy will be complete by, uh, by this summer. And then once we have that strategy, then the implementation phase of Focus Forward CI will begin. So this work will not just last one year. Once we have that strategy completed, it will be a several year effort to implement that strategy to make the changes needed in the region in order to uh, realize the gains we want to see in, eco in economic development here. So I mentioned that series of 11 recommendations. One of those recommendations was to develop a broadband connectivity strategy that was more focused on economic development. So that recommendation itself was broken down into four different components. One was to conduct an assessment of how broadband is used in the region for economic development. Second component was to develop and deliver a broadband education program in order to increase the use of broadband for economic development. 
the third component of that recommendation was to have meetings with broadband providers in order to investigate how greater access could be provided in the region. And then the final component of that recommendation was to develop a five-year connectivity strategy so that in the near future, this region could take steps in order to increase broadband access in the region, increase broadband use in the region, all geared towards strengthening our region's economic development efforts. So for our Broadband Innovation Fund grant, our application was for this entire scope of the project. We received funding to pursue the first two items of the project. So our grant funded project consists of that assessment and then the, the development and delivery of the broadband education program. However, we did hire a consultant to lead this broadband initiative. And the consultant has agreed to take on the full scope of this Focus Force CI broadband initiative. So in addition to the assessment and the development and delivery of the education program, there will also be meetings with broadband providers, and that five-year strategy will be developed. So we're very excited that we are able to pursue the full scope of this broadband recommendation so that broadband can be very closely plugged in to this overall economic development effort. The consultant that's leading this effort is Vital Economy, and that firm is based in Maryland. So in order to identify a consultant to lead this project, we distributed a request for qualifications, and we received eight responses uh, uh, to that RFQ. And, and there were a couple of interesting points about that process. First interesting point was that we received those eight responses uh, nationwide. The responders came from California, Montana, Maryland, Colorado, Pennsylvania, Missouri, and Minnesota. So we had Midwest firms um, seek this work, the West Coast firms, East Coast firms. So we were very interested to see that there was nationwide interest in our project and in simulating broadband use for economic development. The other interesting item from that was that you notice I did not say Illinois. Although we advertised throughout the state uh, using some statewide resources focused on Illinois, there was no firm based in Illinois that responded to our RFQ. So for any broadband, and broadband enthusiasts and budding entrepreneurs on the line, it appears that that could be a, uh, perhaps a, a business need here in Illinois, the development of a broadband planning and consulting firm for broadband related efforts such as this. So our project officially began in January. Uh, the lead vital economy staffers for this project are two gentlemen by the name of Tony and Tom. And Tony and Tom were here in our region last week conducting interviews in all four of the counties to begin this regional broadband assessment. And, and they came up with some interesting notes from their interviews across the region. They conducted some interviews in the Woodford County community of Minunk, and they stopped for lunch at the Blue Star Cafe in downtown Minunk. They entered the cafe. They're wearing their suits. The customers at the cafe did not recognize Tony or Tom. One customer asked them what they were up to. Tony and Tom told the customer. And then they ended up engaging in a conversation with, uh, with the customers at the cafe about what the customers thought of broadband, uh, how they use broadband in their everyday lives. So, so very interesting to get that on the ground perspective on broadband use. Tony and Tom also came across an individual, um, they learned of an individual who was a school teacher 
but on the side has a business creating soap made from goat milk. And his goat milk, goat milk soap business is online. The soap is sold nationwide, entirely online. And apparently this individual makes more money selling goat milk soap than uh, he or she does from teaching. Uh, so a very interesting finding about how, how broadband is being used in the rural parts of our region for economic development. And that's really the beauty of having this broadband initiative housed within this larger economic development initiative because this entire Focus Forward CI process is all about identifying the unique assets in our region and how we can build upon those unique assets to strengthen economic development. So here's a great example of an agricultural based business that's using broadband to make sales nationwide. And the last anecdote I have, Tony and Tom were in the Mason County community of Manitou, stopped to have lunch at a restaurant in Manitou, began talking with the restaurant manager about broadband, and the restaurant manager talked about how she didn't see the need for broadband, didn't think it applied to her restaurant. Well, Tony whipped out his iPhone brought up the app that he, that he had used to find this restaurant, showed it to the restaurant manager, and the restaurant manager's response was, wow, my restaurant's on the internet. And she had no idea that she was on the internet, that individuals could use the internet to find her restaurant. So that's a great example of the type of education we hope to do to show the impact that broadband can have on businesses here in the greater Peoria area. Again, the assessment phase is just underway, so we're still identifying exactly what type of classes we will provide and then identifying the specific audience for these, um, I said classes, we're calling them awareness sessions. But the initial thought right now is that there may be two types of awareness sessions one type that would provide general information about how broadband can be used uh, in everyday life. And then a second type of awareness session that will be more focused on e-commerce and geared more towards budding entrepreneurs who have a business idea, would like to begin a business, but don't have a full understanding of how useful broadband can be for building that business and growing that business. And then also as part of the delivery of the awareness sessions, there will be a train the trainer component. So there will be individuals here from the four county region that will be trained on the broadband education program that will be developed. So that after these 10 awareness sessions are held during this grant period, our local trainers can then in uh, moving forward, go out into the region and provide these broadband awareness sessions to community groups or local, go local governments or whomever uh, is in need of, of this broadband education. So moving forward, after the end of this grant period in May, it's expected that continued broadband education will continue in the region uh, geared for strengthening economic development. It's my contact information if you'd like to follow up with me with any questions about our project. And to finish, I do want to mention that the North Central E-Team has been closely involved with this project. So in addition to myself, there are representatives of our local Economic Development Council, University of Illinois Extension, and the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity that serve on our North Central E-Team, they are all involved with Focus Forward CI and with this broadband initiative. So I thank them for their support and we thank Broadband Illinois for providing us with this funding to get the word out about broadband and how it can be used to strengthen economic development in our region. 
I'll stop there and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, if there are any questions, please raise your hand. I do have one that has been typed in, and that is, um, what do you think the biggest hurdle for the Tri-County area will be, and what will it face um, in terms of challenges with broadband? <clears throat> we still have more assessment work to do in order to identify what our major issues are, but based on the work we've done so far, uh, we've learned that that, um, that, that, that there, there's there's pretty good broadband access regionally. So it's it's not so much an issue of people not having access to broadband; it's more an issue of individuals not fully understanding um, how they can maximize the use of broadband. Uh, for their businesses. This is such, such key information we want to communicate as part of this project. Uh, another hurdle uh, I foresee may be uh, identifying an audience for this project and communicating to individuals that there are these awareness sessions that are occurring. But, but, but to solve or to clear that hurdle, that's really the beauty of having this broadband initiative housed within Focus Forward CI, because Focus Forward CI has engaged so many people in the region, we're confident that when we go out and advertise that these broadband awareness sessions are part of Focus Forward CI, people will recognize that name, they'll recognize that effort to strengthen economic development in the region, and, and they'll be willing to come and learn more about broadband use. Thank you, Nick. Uh, your next question, how have you overcome the local resistance to regional collaboration? Very good question. It is, uh, it's been a very interesting process just because we have engaged private sector, public sector, and not-for-profit social service agencies. I, I, I think one thing is that the process we followed has, has been has been very helpful in just bringing individuals on board. It's been a very open process from the get-go, particularly from conducting those interviews with over 300 individuals in the region, asking them, uh, what are your thoughts about economic development in the region? What is your role in economic development in the region? Uh, from that time, it was made clear that that there was interest in engaging essentially everybody from the region in uh, in our economic development efforts. Um, oh yes, yes. I also wanted to say I, I talked earlier about how this initiative has engaged 1,000 individuals to date, and a big part of that is that this has been. It, uh, a process driven from the bottom up. So earlier I mentioned that those 1,000 individuals have been engaged either by attending meetings or by being part of volunteer action teams. A, 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 a hallmark of Focus Forward CI has been the inclusion of these volunteer action teams. So for example, at the very beginning of this strategy process, when we were identifying our economic development goals for the region, a team of volunteers was put together in order to develop those goals so that the goals were not coming from the consultant, they were coming from individuals here in the region. A couple other examples, there is a, uh, an Hispanic and Latino action team. So that action team is devoted to ensuring that the voices of Hispanic and Latino residents in the region are heard, and that this process addresses their needs and concerns. There's also a volunteer action team called the Gen Next Action Team, which is engaging the 25 to 44 year old population and identifying what that population's needs are in order to make this region a more attractive place for individuals from that age group. 
and, and there are several other action teams that have been developed. So it's really just been a process where we have, um, where we, where individuals from the region have been enabled to take a leadership role and to drive this process. And I think that's been the most successful aspect in order to overcome that issue of regional collaboration. Okay, thank you very much. I don't see any more questions for Nick. We have had several comments throughout the presentations today. Everyone thought that this has gone very well and a kudos to the four presenters. So thank you, a round of applause all around. And if there are no further questions, I can uh, start to summarize this and uh, let everyone get on with their afternoon. We do invite you for our final webinar series on the Broadband Innovation Fund awarded projects. And that will be next Tuesday, February 19th at two o'clock. The four presenters will be Lakeland College, Metropolitan Chicago Healthcare Council, also known as MCHC, 21st Century Youth Project, also out of Chicago, and Integrated Therapy Services in Newton, Illinois. So there will be another press release. You can go on to Broadband Illinois website and register for that. We thank you for the large attendance today and for all of the questions and feedback and continued interest in all of the programs that are happening throughout Illinois. So thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon and a great week.